Hey, what up? Welcome back. Sorry we took a break last week. I was taking some time to read up and research this one. It's gonna be a fat one. So, thanks for your patience. What we're doing this week is we are looking at mythologies from mystical traditions. Specifically, mythologies that pertain to the creation of the cosmos. The creation of the world as we know it, existence as we find it. These are called cosmogenies. Cosmogenies, the beginning of the cosmos. And they are etiological myths. We're going to get all of the technical jargon right out in the beginning. So you're all up to scratch with it. All you laymen. Um, etiological because they explain how things came to be, namely how existence came to be. So we've tried to take all of the myths, I've tried to take all the myths here from all the different traditions and try to see their commonalities here. A bit of a comparative move inspired by some famous mythologists, people like Carl Jung, um, Marseille Liad. I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I know, but that is the perks of being an autodidact and dyslexic. And most importantly, Joseph Campbell, who was very popular for his monomyth, looking at myths across traditions and seeing the commonalities between them. So we're going to be looking for a grand myth, a meta myth, something like that, which will hopefully be satisfying and true on many levels, both, well, predominantly poetically, which may be a little difficult, as well, I hope that it has some, and we'll see this, this will be cool if it works in the end, if it has some truths that translate into the scientific myth that we have today of creation. Now, I'm going to qualify the way that I'm using myth very shortly, so don't worry. But we're going to be looking for a process that hopefully is replicated or can be seen, can be projected to be replicated in biological processes in cosmological, evolutionary, psychological, internal processes. And we're going to start to see this is going to start to get a bit trippy. <laughs> so hang with me. I didn't know whether I wanted to try and smush all these myths into one myth um, and then just present it all together and see if we could somehow satisfy um, and touch all the bases and all the myths without thinning it down too much. Or to present them parallel and then let you see the similarities. This is going to be quite heretical. <laughs> Warning has been given. I know there will be some people who like this, but I also know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Which is good, I love hate mail. Keep it coming. Okay, now two definitions. Firstly, a myth is not a lie. That is the way that myth is used in common jargon, but that is not how myth is used in the study of mythology. Myth is not a story, which is untrue. It is a truth told in the form of a story. I know that's a good line. I didn't make it up. So when I say something is a myth, I'm not calling it a lie. I'm calling it a truth in the form of a story or narrative. A truth that cannot be expressed in straightforward analytical, descriptive, factual language, because it transcends those categories. Very good. Now, there's a particular importance with creation myths, which is what we'll be looking at here today. Creation myths address, this is a quote as well, creation myths address questions deeply meaningful to the society that shares them, revealing the central worldview and their framework for the self-identity of the culture and the individual in a universal context. So, Creation myths, which are some of the most prevalent myths amongst cultures, are mythologies that ground a society because we have this natural tendency to want to know how we got here, what we're doing here. Surprise, surprise. And none of us here showed up with a manual out of the womb, how to life. So we create these mythologies to explain how we get here, what we're doing, and where we're heading. So it's natural to want to know how on earth we got here. But the additional function of these creation myths is not simply the etiology, namely explaining how we got here, but it also provides this, um, it also provides this soteriology, where we're heading, how we're getting back to. 
because, as we'll see in many of these myths, the idea is to return to the primordial state, to return to where we came from. And if you want to return, you've got to first figure out where you came from. Hence, the beauty and importance of these myths. Now, because we're going to find a lot of similarity, we're going to have to ask the question why they're similar. And they're similar, I think, for one of two reasons. Firstly, because these traditions did not happen in total isolation, in vacuum. They were in communication with one another, so they shared to some degree and influenced each other's cosmogenies and cosmologies and theories and mythologies and theologies. And, but I think more significantly, particularly in mysticism, when one believes that mysticism is based in a true phenomena of mysticism, a unitive experience, when, then, when one then goes to reconcile that unity, which they believe to be the ultimate and the primordial, with the multiplicity which they see in everyday life, with the many around them, there aren't that many options then to devise a schema, a myth, where the one somehow multiplies into the many. And we'll see that there are these almost logical steps of progression that these traditions find which flow from that experience, from, from, the, from that dual experience, from the experience of unity in the mystical experience and the experience of multiplicity in everyday life. In the reconciling between these two experiences emerges somewhat naturally the mystical cosmology. How do you like that? Now, don't worry if this has gone over your head. It is over my head too, I will tell you that. I'm just going to throw it out there and together we're going to see what we can make of this mess. I'm looking forward to your feedback and here we go. Long introduction. Wow. Well done. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at a series of traditions. We're going to look at Egyptian myths, Greek myths, Greco-Roman myths, Neoplatonistic myths, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, Sufism, Theosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese, and then some scientific cosmology, biology, um, did I mention Christian myths? Yes, we'll do that too. Don't worry. And we're going to see their common elements in them in this metaphysical metamyth of mysticism. Kaboom. What we're going to do is we're going to pause at this point, now that we've had all this introduction out of the way, and next week you're going to get the next installment where we're going to talk about the actual myths from these various traditions and seeing their intense amount of similarity and differences and how that is going to play into some other theories and spaces that we're going to talk about catch you later subscribe stay tuned hope you love this love you